Searching the Scriptures with Watchman Alexander, Episode 20. Is everybody in the world going to die before someone finds the answer? Do I have to remind you that theory is the beginning of solution? What are we up against? Is it a dangerous thing? All I've ever known to be true is a lie. I didn't say it would be easy. I just said it would be the truth. Welcome to Searching the Scriptures with Watchman Alexander, where we break away from religious systems and man-made dogma to learn the Word of God from an independent Hebraic perspective. And now your host, the prophecy buff who tackles the tough stuff, Alexander Lawrence. Hello and shalom. The hour is late, the time is short, and the storm is coming. So now is your opportunity for a systems check. I'm here to wake up the sleeping servants of Yahweh God and equip them for the last days. I do that by teaching discernment, pouring over prophecies, treating the infection of mystery Babylon in the church, and giving you courage. So it's been a few weeks since we've spoken, and this week's episode is not going to continue on with our Laying the Foundation series. I promise I will get back to that. But I have a little bit of a different circumstance this week because I'm getting ready to go to the Hear the Watchman conference. And I have a friend here who's also going to be going there. He's going to be helping out with the conference. And he's staying at our house for a few days in preparation for that. So I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity and have him on. His name is Taylor Joseph. And we're just going to chat about things. There's not really an agenda today. Um, there's something that the Lord has laid on Taylor's heart to talk about a little bit, but I'm sure we're going to end up going off onto tangents and all kinds of other topics. So uh, this will be a little bit of a, you know, flying by the seat of our pants, and that's okay. Most of my podcasts are pretty well planned, but it doesn't have to be that way. So I'm looking forward to what happens today. With that having been said, Taylor, welcome. Well, thank you, Watchman Alexander, and shalom to everyone out there listening. It's a pleasure to be here, not just on the podcast, which is an honor, but to be in the Lawrence home. And so I've just, I want to start out by saying that the Lawrence family are gracious hosts. So if you were wondering out there what it would be like to, to be in the presence of Watchman Alexander and his wonderful wife, Amanda, it's, it's a privilege. <laughs> I'm not just for saying talking that about because him. he's holding up notes in front of me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're going to have some fun today, guys. Yes, yes, we are. And this is the first time I've ever had someone sitting down in the office with me. You know, thankfully, uh, the Lord has provided two microphones, one which was a gift to me a while back. So uh, this for is such a time as this for just such a time. He's yeah. going to learn that I interrupt a lot. And so it'll be fun. We'll see how Watchman Alexander's patience really plays out in the real world. Well, the thing is, I actually have all the control because I can edit all of this mm -hmm. in post. So if you get glitchy sentences, you'll know he edited in post. <laughs> <laughs> They're just going to get little blurbs of you. And I'm most not of even going to be in the show at hardly all. Hardly <laughs> at all. That's right. Well, let's, let's take off. Um, tell the audience a little bit about you. And I mean, you're, okay, so let me preface this by saying that Taylor is not a, a scholar or uh, any kind of an expert in a particular field. He would not claim that he is. Um, but he is a man of the Lord who is uh, seeking to grow as we all are seeking to um, have the spirit manifest in his life more and more. And he is somebody who absorbs a lot of material from a lot of different teachers, um, studies the Bible a lot, and, and just has a good broad base of knowledge. And he's a smart guy, a sharp guy. So I enjoy talking with him. We bounce ideas off of each other. And just the other night, we were talking for probably a couple hours about theology from, you know, starting from the beginning of creation and bouncing around all over the place. So I love just having those kind of conversations with him. And hopefully we can have something like that today. But he's not an expert. And as with all things, you know, test these things for yourself. 
Same with me. I'm not a guy with a lot of degrees or a lot of deep knowledge that's been handed down to me. What I get, I get mostly from the spirit, from studying the word of God. So, you know, that's my disclaimer. You know what you're getting into now. And I, and I'll, I'll affirm that. I don't claim to be an expert. I, I, I use the, thus saith the Lord very, very carefully and with fear and trembling. I've only a few times in my life really felt strongly. The Lord is telling me to say this. So everything else, it's just, Hey, this is my personal experience. This is my understanding. This is where I'm at. And I don't presume it to be better. It's just unique to me. And if someone can learn from that, then praise Yah. If, if not, then praise Yah. So, so tell us about your journey in short. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my basic story, you know, I grew up in, in the church in Christendom in the non-denominational realm. Um, I didn't have kind of a, a harsh, crazy, magnificent come to Yeshua story. I've kind of cycled through the prodigal parable plenty of times in my life. I mean, I've, I've been to some depths of darkness and, you know, maybe we'll get into that. Maybe not. Uh, we'll see where the spirit leads, but basically, you know, I, I've, I've grown up believing in Jesus of Nazareth and the Bible is the word of God. And I've gone off on periods of time where I've really struggled with that, you know, tested other belief systems, philosophies, and just come to the final conclusion. The unshakable conclusion in my heart is that translations aside, the Bible, the old and new covenants are the revelation of the creator God, who is one who is eternal and who came in the flesh as Yeshua of Nazareth and is the only way to salvation. And the goal for me isn't just to get a ticket to heaven. The goal for me is to impact the people around me out of service to the perfect and holy God and compassion for people that are struggling both in the temporal and may lead themselves into struggling in the eternal. How I go about that, that's the journey. Because, uh, you know, I, I've struggled over the years to come up with a system, you know, an easy fix to things. And I've, I've concluded that life is it's very complicated and complex and cause and effect is not singular or linear. And so, you know, we have to be dependent upon the the wisdom of the spirit in every moment and the truth of the revealed word and the humility of knowing that no matter how many answers we have that we don't have all the answers and i think that humility i was i was telling alex last night you know that's kind of been my buzzword a lot lately is how do i become humble enough to let the spirit flow through me in, in my interactions and, and along my journey so that I'm not getting in the way with my pride and thinking that I have acquired some treasure with which to, you know, incite jealousy in the people around me, which I see that kind of play out knowingly or unknowingly in a lot of people in ministries. So I, I really try to ward off against that in my life. So that's, I mean, that's a little bit of who I am. I'm very eclectic personality. And, uh, but, but my heart is for people. My heart is for Messiah. My heart is for the, the eternal God. And I struggle, you know, every day to live in the, the purity of that, just like we all do. And that's me. I mean, <laughs> in a, in a very confining nutshell. <laughs> yeah, we have interesting conversations because Taylor goes deep as I do. But one of the interesting things about him is that he can also just get a conversation started. He seems to be an outgoing person who can you know, really get along with strangers. He drives uh, for Lyft. Is that right? Lyft? It's not Uber? Yes, correct. Talk to us a little bit about how you make use of those opportunities and what a person like me can do to get better at that because I'm introverted and it's not always easy for me to just start conversations. I'm perfectly okay with going deep with people. In fact, I like talking about the meaty spiritual topics and philosophy and those things, but getting there oftentimes is difficult for me. Um, but you're doing it on a regular basis. So how does that go? Yes. Thank you. Um, 
yeah, I, I had I had told Alex that you know I've, I felt the Lord wanted me to share some testimony, you know, to to testify to really His work with what I do with Lyft, and I I I do it. It's an interim job right now, but I used to do it full time, where I would drive fifty hours a week, so meeting you know a couple hundred people every week. And I, I came to the point where I really wanted it to be a ministry. I wanted to be able to use it to impact people, you know, to, to get to the, the serious. I don't, I don't really like doing the superficial conversations, you know, how's the weather? How's your cat? Like, I want to talk about real stuff that's affecting real people, whether it's political or, you know, religious or philosophical or practical, you know, just whatever it is. And so I, I saw that the Lord had provided an opportunity for me to do that with people. And sometimes, you know, really I only have five minutes with a person and sometimes I have 45 minutes and, you know, so the the conversation varies based on that. And some people are open and some people are reserved. And, and so it's kind of, it's an interesting daily thing and, and ride by ride thing because, you know, I, I really, I have a conversation with the Lord throughout my whole shift where I'm, I'm saying, okay, I, I'm choosing to believe that the people I pick up, I pick up on purpose. Like I don't believe in chance. I believe that you have the ability to move my navigation so that I pick up someone that you need me to pick up. Now, maybe it's not every single person, but maybe three people, three rides lead to the person that I'm supposed to interact with. And I'm uniquely prepared for what they uniquely need to hear. I really believe that the Lord interacts with us in this world like that. And so test that (laughs) biblically, but that's what I believe. I believe that he he is inner interacting in the affairs of men in those kind of ways, navigating us. And so, you know, I'm I'm asking that question and it's interesting. I I wanted to share, like, I, I don't like to just share things I do this or I did this or the Lord did this through me without also qualifying it with the reality of my own weakness and fragility and hypocrisy. So there are plenty of people that get in my car that I clam up. You know, I I feel the spirit telling me, you know, ask them if they even know about Jesus and I will go the whole ride with that internal argument and, and I won't do it. So I'm not saying I am, you know, the apostle to lift and I'm out there saving souls left and right. That's, that's not it. But what's amazing to me in that reality is that I, I see and experience the spirit doing it anyway, even when I get caught in my head or caught in that fear that we all face, you know, uh, you know, if I, if I bring up this thing that's important to me, but they don't accept it, you know. How's that going to make me feel? And we, we battle with that, that doubt. I, I, I'm assuming that you do because I do. And, and I hear other people do as well. So forgive my assumptions for you listening audience, but I'm just going to presume I have a modicum of a handle on the general human experience. But, you know, so that's also been part of the journey, you know, to, to, in a long way, answer your question, Alex, about how does one accomplish this? It's accepting that you're not always going to nail it. You're not always going to get it right. You know, I, I've had whole days where, you know, I end the day and just feel ashamed. Like, I know I had something for that person and I didn't give it to him. But either you can let that shame, you know, continue to imprison you or you can let that motivate you the next time to be more bold. And I've had on the, uh, on the inverse times where I have just had that internal conversation with the Lord. I feel like he tells me exact cause it, it's different each, each time. Like sometimes it's, you know, ask the person how their day's going and, and I, and I won't, won't even do that. I'll wrestle with that. You know, I'm like, oh, I just don't feel like talking to somebody right now. Or sometimes it's like, you need to get the word Jesus out in the next 20 words that you say, whatever, however you get there. And, you know, and sometimes I will, sometimes I won't. But the when I do, it's opened up doors to really powerful encounters. And I wanted to share a couple of those. 
So there was this one time, I, I live in California. I think most of you know that Alex doesn't live in California. I don't know how undisclosed his location is. I deal with a lot of conspiracy people in my <laughs> in my world, but, um, I'm not as far from California physically as I could be, but I'm about as far from it ideologically well, as I could be. Okay, that wasn't even the reference, <laughs> <laughs> but I physically live in California and I also astronomically am separated from California's <laughs> social politics, you know, a little nugget. I may be arrested soon, but that's different. <laughs> um, but so, so I drive in Los Angeles a lot. And, you know, for those of you that are familiar with Los Angeles or it may be just be this archetype of evil, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where you're at, but there was this gal I picked up and, you know, she'd been out drinking. I, you know, you have to pick up people who are out on the town sometimes at night. And I just, when she got in the car, I, I could feel this sadness. Um, and so, oh, you know, I should start with this. I, I made a commitment um, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, that I was only going to play music in my car that glorified the Lord. So I, I have a kind of a playlist that has various things. It's soft, reflective, meditative. I've got some Hebrew worship. I've got some, you know, contemporary Christian worship, you know, just a variety. But I, I really believe that music is a conduit of worship. And so I refuse to allow the worship of false gods or false ideas in my car. And that's been, that's been a source of contention because some writers presume that because they've rented your vehicle for a small period of time that they have total control over what happens there. And I, I've actually had to pull over and cancel a ride because I, I'm sure that there was a unseen spirit involved in this, but I mean, I, I nearly got attacked by a woman just because I told her that I didn't want to hear her particular music. And then we got into a whole rights debate, which that's a different podcast. Wow. I hadn't even thought about that, but yeah, yeah I can see where that would be contentious. Yeah. So, so I've had those, not a lot of those encounters, you know, cause I'm, I go in prayed up and, and I'm constantly, you know, doing, at least internally, spiritual warfare. You know, I just I presume that there are spirits that are going to enter my car. And, you know, so I, I'm constantly asking the Lord for protection and for mercy and for insight. You know, if we need to get wild and speak out against this or 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 not, you know, I, I, I never know. I don't claim to have any amazing discernment on what spirits are attached or around a person. That's not my gifting. So usually I just try to focus on the, the person, you know, and if I can speak to them and, and I pray, I pray for everyone that comes into my car, whether I in, interact with them vocally or not. And, and so I, I really believe that the Lord uses that like to kind of shake up the foundations that might be in their life. I, I was thinking earlier about, you know, the, the verse that really symbolizes, signifies what this lift ministry is for me is, you know, what Paul talks about when he says that some plant the seed, some water, but the spirit makes it grow. My, it, that's Paul, right? I want to make sure that I'm not misquoting. The I word. think so. Yeah. I always go, it could have been Paul. It might've been Peter. Maybe it was Yeshua. Somebody said <laughs> the spirit inspired someone to write down that and we have it. <laughs> so just to give you it's a, in that's, the epistle somewhere. That, that's my attitude. Like I don't, I, I'm not good with, exact quotations. I have so much of the word of God hidden in my heart, but I am not good at <laughs> retrieving it academically. So I just, I let it all saturate and affect how I choose. That's because you've got too many movie quotes. I do have a lot there. of movie quotes, which Alexander feels threatened. because <laughs> Amanda and I will movie quote back and forth and it goes right over his perfectly shaved head. For those you were going to say fuzzy little head, but I you wasn't couldn't say fuzzy. Uh, I was going to say dome, but then I thought dome was <laughs> a weird word to use. So back to yeah, the it bounces right off that polished dome. Yep. Fwing! Um. So back to the gal in Los Angeles. So I picked her up. I just I could tell there was you know something going on, but you don't want to you know to 
to always be circling around the the particular question you asked, Alex, you know, you, you don't want to just even if the spirit's giving you discernment, you don't want to just jump <laughs> in head first. Like I perceive from the spirit of God that you are experiencing depression or oppression or <laughs> caught in sin like Yeshua knew when and how to do that. I think we should all be very temperate with how we do that unless we really have learned the submission and obedience to hear the Lord clearly. I like to always assume when I have that voice in my head that it might be the Lord, it might be my flesh, and it might be the enemy. So I that's what I mean when I say I wrestle with stuff because I don't want to just go with my first instinct because who can say which it is until I've really wrestled it out and, you know, read the, read the signs around me. So read the room they say in, uh, co in comedy, but, um, so, but I, I, I knew something, something was up with this gal. And, um, so I had my music playing and I just started praying for her, you know, in, in my mind, not out loud. Um, she was in the backseat. Most people sit in the backseat. And she asked me, like, what's that music? And then I my first thought was, oh, boy, I'm going to have to argue for my right to play <laughs> my own music in my car. And I said, oh, it's, it's some worship music. So goes, Can you turn it up? It reminds me of music that my mother used to play when I was a kid. I was like, oh, cool. This is great. Like, so I, I turn it up a little bit. She starts listening and I can see through the rearview mirror that she's She's kind of tearing up. So I turn the music down because I'm like, this is it. The door's open. Like, I'm going to minister to this gal. And she said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I just, you know, wanted to talk. She's like, turn the music back up. <laughs> I'm like, OK, so I turn the music back up, shut my mouth, and then I go into conversation mode with the Lord. <laughs> and I, I, I really believe I heard him say, I got this. Like, let me do this. You just provide the safe space. So she like full blown is crying in the back seat. I, you know, it's another seven minutes to her destination. I get to her destination and then we get to talk. And she talks about, you know, being backslidden from the Lord and being in a relationship with a guy and all of this stuff. And I, I just, I felt the spirit come upon me in this power. And I looked her in the eyes and I said, your daddy loves you and he has not forsaken you. And she just poured out these tears and I could feel the atmosphere just change and feel this warmth and presence. Now that's one example. That's not, I don't have magnificent miraculous experiences on the day to day. I mean, I, there are very few where I would use words like I felt the presence of the Lord. You know, I, I don't, I, I don't like even navigating those waters because people abuse that. And I think there are a lot of false spirits that give a lot of great feelings. And yeah, so, right. so I'm very careful with that. Um, and I don't like sensationalizing the testimony, but that was a, that was one that has always stuck with me as a really powerful encounter. But most of them, most of the encounters I have, is just, I really think, opportunity to plant or water seeds, you know, to bring up the Bible, the name of Jesus or Yeshua, the, even in political arenas, the idea of conserving morality in our culture and challenge what people are hearing in the mainstream media or seeing from Hollywood or you know, just believing because they haven't taken the time to test things themselves. When I love getting teenage, college age kids, because I challenge what they're learning in schools. I challenge them and say, do you know you're going to give an account before a holy God? Do you, do you know that you're being taught Marxism and that's a dangerous religion? Like, so I'll get into all kinds of things. I talk to people about the Nephilim <laughs> archaeology that the work Ellie Marzulli does, or I, you know, I talk to people about what the Hebrew roots movement is awakening in Christendom. Um, so we talk about whatever people will let me talk about. And I think it's unique to each person that gets in the car, but 
Do you have any practical advice for how to get that how to, started? How to do it? Yeah. I think, you know, that's kind of why I wanted to share the the ways that I don't always do it is to encourage anyone that might feel intimidated by the idea of um, opening up a conversation with a stranger. I'm I'm fairly good at it, and yet I get intimidated. So there's an element of just trying it, practice, you know, taking a leap of faith. But I always, I usually what I do, even in my vehicle, is I kind of open the door and see if they walk through it. So, you know, it's just something simple with a Hi, how are you? And if it goes fine and falls flat, then I don't really force it. So I don't walk around with like this urgent need to impact the lives of strangers. I more look at it like, I have an opportunity. And then when the conversation is opened up, that's when I bring in the the heavy guns. But I think it's important to be mindful that we're not all on the same page. We haven't all even heard or learned the same things. We, we all have, you know, our brokenness, our damage, our baggage. So being gentle, especially with a stranger is important. Like I'll, I'll have conversations with atheists or, you know, people that have a, social political perspective that is to an extreme on the other side of a spectrum than I am. And I I don't presume to try to correct them or change their minds. I, I really had to commit that I am a proclaimer and that's all I have to do, right? That's the, that's what the watchman on the wall does says, this is what I see you do with it, what you will. Now my hands are clean. And so if we kind of take a step back from what might be the urgent thing in our mind to impart to someone else, then we can open up a a dialogue to maybe find out what we already agree on and work from there. You know, I think that apologists talk a lot about that is finding a common ground. I listen to Ravi Zacharias a lot. I really, really respect his work. Um, So I'm constantly trying to take, take those tools, but here's another trick. That actually helped me with my mother. And now now I shouldn't get too personal because she might listen to this. But my mother and I have had, you know, uh, an up and down relationship. I I love her to death. We don't always see eye to eye on things. But with her and with really everyone else, I, I came to the conclusion that if I see everyone around me as a child, because in the eyes of the eternal, I mean, we're called child we're all children, children throughout throughout the biblical text, but we can even use that practically. It's like the old adage, you know, when when you get stage fright, you're supposed to see the audience naked. Well, that's inappropriate. But if you see the audience as children, some of that that tension and the stakes that we carry around subconsciously can be eliminated. And if if we understand that there is an author and he is sovereign, then you have to believe that he's he's doing it. It doesn't mean it's going to make sense how he's doing it. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to anticipate the move. But if we trust him, then we can walk in that freedom to encounter one another without having the stakes so high that we get closed off to what exactly the spirit wants to do with that conversation. So that that leads into my other buzzword which is um just one thing about yeah. kids it's repetition that is necessary in order for a child to really get a grasp on something and sometimes i will say something to isaac and expect him to pick it up and run with it and you know just have it after that point because i've said it to him and that's my own failing because he needs exposure again and again and again most of the time to to really understand and I think adults are, are like that too. And sometimes obviously we get things more quickly, but we really have to have more than one session with a new concept or a new idea before it begins to take root and we can integrate it into what we already know. So a lot of these conversations that we might have with strangers is just that one little flash of exposure to something new. And the Lord is going to use multiple different things throughout their lives 
to bring this new concept of you know, whatever it may be, the, the gospel or something uh, into their heart in a way that they can understand it. Yes. And we don't have to do it all at once, but that's kind of my, one of my struggles is that sometimes I want to dive right in and like expose the whole gospel to people, you know, get them to understand everything from A to Z. And that's usually not practical. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I found the word that I was looking for and that was expectations. You know, we, we, it's, it's wise to challenge our expectations when we enter into a circumstance or a relationship or, a, you know, whether it's small or large, it's good to understand what am I really expecting from this? And is that reasonable? And a lot of times I've found that the expectations are just there to trip me up. You know, if I, if I go, go into the setting or the, the relationship or the experience trusting that, you know, my Abba is good. My, my almighty God is sovereign and he's working things out that I don't fully understand and am not the only piece of that puzzle, then I'm able to be more myself. I don't have to fake it in ways that I presume are important to that agenda that I think I have, right? And I can I can flow more freely with the spirit and with the way that he designed me. So I think it's important to, you know, because I I would definitely agree and I probably could run circles around <laughs> Alex about feeling like I need to be the savior of all things. I mean, I, I wrestle with that motivation in me. Like I've got to fix everything. And I I've learned over the years more and more. It's the, the humbling that the Lord has brought me through to realize I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just a piece. I'm just a part of the body. It's body dynamics. We, we have our part to play so that the whole can, can work to, bring salvation and restoration to the earth, the whole body of Christ under the headship of Messiah. We are just the thumb or the gallbladder or the skin cell. And we don't fully even know what exactly we are. <laughs> I think a lot of people try to lay claim to a part of the body they want to be. And that has nothing to do with <laughs> their actual design. So, I mean, I'm constantly searching that out, you know, with the Lord, what, what part of the body I am. And, and I, I don't always get the answers I want. I don't always get the clarification I want. And that ties into the humility. But when I'm aware of my own limitations and my need for him to be my Lord today, not just eternally, but today, I can't even get through today without his presence and his power and his influence. Then I can understand and have patience and grace and mercy for the limitations of other people. So, yeah, I think that, you know, spiritually and practically is an important answer to the question. How do I interact with other people? Well, first, I have to really understand who I am and, and what that means. Not only the, the gifts and the, the great bounty of blessing that I have in Messiah, but my humanity, my limitations, my shortcomings, things that I, I am working out with fear and trembling before the Lord and with the Lord, but some of them are still there. They're still giants in my land. And so if I ever catch myself in that pride of self-righteousness or otherness that seeks to push others away or make them feel less, even if I'm using language, like I want to bring you up to this place of elevation at which I have found myself. I just, I don't think that's kingdom work. I don't think that's the spirit. I think that we are called to be servants, to carry each other's burdens, to lay down our lives for each other. And that's not just in this grandness of martyrdom, but in the daily taking it in the gut, you know, having it hurt to be vulnerable with people. That's, I mean, wow. I think that was the Lord, like just said that through me. I, I'm going to, I'm sitting with that. Wow. Yeah. The, the choice to be vulnerable with other people is, is a taking up of the cross because it's hard. 
because it hurts, but there's power that flows through vulnerability. I was trying to convince somebody of that very thing at church a couple of weeks ago. This person struggles to not, I think because they have a very sensitive um, honor and shame complex that they tend to just sweep everything under the rug. And I used to be that way. And I have learned through the school of hard knocks mostly um, and Amanda's help to a large extent that it's better to just be transparent about everything. It really is better to bring everything into the light, to be vulnerable, whether it feels bad at first or not. And the enemy will try and leverage shame against us. But if we can get over that, if we can realize, no, there isn't shame, even when there's guilt involved, that shame emotion is a good thing to get us to acknowledge the guilt, bring it out, deal with it, be done with it. You know, you put it under the blood. It's gone. You no longer are guilty. Therefore, you no longer have to feel any shame for that. But if you just push things to the side and never deal with them, then you have allowed the enemy to continually bring that back in and accuse you of it. And so the shame continues to be there, even if you're pushing it down, keeping it under, under the surface. Yeah, because because we're taught to confess our sins one to another. And he is faithful to to cleanse us of all unrighteousness and heal us. And I I think that there's a practical element to that. It's not just a spiritual principle. I think it's a psychological principle. It it affects the enemy's ability to use shame because shame operates in in the recesses of our our inner self. But when when other people are given the opportunity to see you more clearly as you are right now and still show love, the love of God and the the forgiveness to you, that just treads on the scorpion and the serpent and all of those attempts at darkness. You know, whenever we're pulled away from fellowship or community or opportunity to give and receive love, that's how the enemy wins. Right. And this goes beyond sin issues. It goes into building fellowship and being able to connect and strengthen each other as a body. Because if you don't know people, if you don't really know what's going on with them, you don't form those friendships and the Christian fellowship that we want to call family, that we should call family. It's not fostered unless people are being open with their lives. And one of my big problems with the way that church is done today is that in many places that never happens. You people will go into a building on a Sunday total for two strangers. hours, yep. say hi to a bunch of strangers, just like surface level small talk and walk out and have no idea what's going on with those people the other six days or even the rest of that day because they're only seeing them in this one setting. Whereas what I see in the word is God calling his people into a walk together throughout their whole lives. Yeah. And a body, a one new man, a singularity. <laughs> yeah. In unable to separate us one from another. You know, I think that's the the design of community. And that's been the, the great trick of the modern era is this individualization, mm-hmm. this I am an island, you know, or, and I can pick and choose the, the pieces of interconnectedness that benefit me, but I'm not going to, you know, deal with anything that requires vulnerability or sacrifice. And we're missing out on so much of the way that we are designed to complement one another, not just in like a marriage relationship or a family unit, but in community. None of us have all of the pieces. And the more pieces that you allow to be a part, you know, I'm saying pieces as people, the more that are you allow to be in your life, the the fuller picture you get of who the creator is, who Jesus Yeshua is, but it requires courage. It requires Mm -hmm. tenacity, requires resilience to get back up. You know, I'll I'll, I'll share this. I I don't know if we want to spend a lot of time on it, but I've committed suicide in my life more than once. And I, I don't say attempted to commit suicide because I medically should be dead on three separate accounts. I won't go into the details, but I, I thoroughly believe that I was miraculously either preserved or resurrected 
but I, I believe that the Lord spared me for a reason. So I understand darkness. I understand shame. I understand not wanting to go on. And so for me, just being here today at 35 is a testament of God, of his realness, of his purpose, of his love, of his mercy. And so I have to give a lot of grace for myself and for other people. And it, I think that's important. I did not expect this to become such a serious <laughs> yeah. conversation. I'm a fun guy, really. He is. Yeah. Um, it takes courage to live at all. I mean, that's why people get to a place where they want to commit suicide. It's hard. But when we exercise the courage to be vulnerable, we actually make life better, more joyous, you know, more free. And we, we come to a place where um, we don't feel the fear of life the way that we did before. But part of the, the problem is, is the hiding gets us into a bad mental state. But anyway, back to talking about speaking with strangers, um, the, the oh, whole oh, right uh, yeah. from 40 minutes you, ago, you mentioned <laughs> the indiv individuality of this age and how it's not like it used to be. The culture is different. And that makes it very interesting when you're trying to talk to strangers, especially about things like the kingdom of God. Yeah, I think it's a, a little bit of a double edged sword, because on the one hand, people are not used to being vulnerable. They're not used to connecting with other people on a deep level, um, especially right off the bat. But the, the other side of that is that people are yearning for some of that. Yeah. You know, they're so isolated in many instances that they want people who care about them to talk to them. And we care because God cares and that that's his heart coming through us. And so if we can just get out of our own little fear bubble and get into somebody else's lives for a minute and be like, you know what? I want to know what's going on with you. I want to know who you are. I, I want to know how I might be able to help you. Not that we say that, but that's what we're doing. Right. And, um, and people will pick up on that if we do it genuinely. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And I, I think it's funny when you said, you know, get out of our fear bubble. It just the thought flashed in my head to to reinforce. And it's not going to be this like before and after. Right. Like, well, OK, once I can get out of this place of fear, then I can accomplish that ability to interact with people. No. I still have that fear bubble. So you, you're, you're still going to have that mm -hmm. in varying degrees. You know, the more that you practice a skill, the better you become at it and the less you fear it because you're so familiar with it. That's how it works. But you have to just do it. And, and if you're listening, like I've listened to podcasts that have inspired me, not that I imagine this. Well, I hope that the spirit of God will make it inspirational. I you'd be surprised. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what the feedback. It'll talk to somebody out there. But but it, I, I've listened to podcasts or, or teachings or sermons or something. And, you know, you get stirred up and you're like, I'm going to go do it. And then you don't do it that day the way that you expected to or even the next day. And then you go, oh, I'm going to forget that I ever heard or felt that because clearly it, it didn't work. The The kingdom of God is not. It's a process. Look, look at the, the book of history that we have. Look at everyone around you. It's a messy, messy process. It's bloody and sweaty and stinky. And that's it. It's real. It's raw. And we all make mistakes and we all fail to meet our expectations. And we already know we will never meet the holiness of God. That's why Yeshua had to die. But the more that we can grow and learn and lay down the things of our flesh and overcome the things of this world and choose righteousness and holiness and reverence and sober mindedness and compassion and mercy and love and forgiveness, we build the kingdom. He builds the kingdom through us. It's this symbiosis, synergy, working together. So it's. It's not about getting 
fired up and going and becoming great at something in an instant. It's about, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take what I learned and I'm, I'm going to give it a try. And I'm going to expect, this is the expectation you can have. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to fail, but I'm not going to let that stop me. If you can overcome that, that will apply. I mean, that's, I, I spent 25 years in the theater and I taught theater to children. And I, I really believe that working in theater can apply to a lot of things. And that's, that's one of it, those principles that it applies, not just to how I interact with strangers, but how I interact with my spouse or how I interact with my children, understanding your own humanity in the right context can help you in how you see other people and build a life of community that is powerful and that will will draw people. It's that city on the hill principle, right? It's the very nature of what ancient Israel was. It was to be a light to the nations. Mm -hmm. You talked about watching something or hearing a sermon or, you know, getting a glimpse of somebody else doing something great for the kingdom and going out thinking that you're going to be a super evangelist because that's gotten you pumped up. <laughs> and I have felt that on more than one occasion. Yeah. Um, so I know exactly what you're talking about. I think it's really important that we have those moments because we do need to get pumped up. I mean, there's a reason sure. that coaches oh, yeah, give pep talks to their teams before they send them out on the field. But it is that day after day doing what you don't really want to necessarily, you know, doing the hard things yeah. over and over again to get to that point where you can perform at that level. So it's like watching the Olympics, which just got over recently. And you see these people doing these amazing feats and you're like, oh, yeah, like I would love to be able to go out and do that. I, I wouldn't. It's too cold. Or, in the <laughs> well, <laughs> or uh, listening to an awesome musician yeah. and thinking, yeah, I'm going to play piano <laughs> like that or I'm going to play the, the, the guitar like that. Well, no, you're not. You're not going to just <laughs> pick up an instrument and play it that way or go out in the field and perform like that. You're going to do little things over and over again to train yourself to become yep. finally the kind of athlete or musician that can get in front of a crowd and do something at that level. Yeah, we need to temper our expectations. For those for those out there that are cinephiles like myself that quote movies, they, they might get this reference. I'm baby stepping. I'm doing the work. I'm baby stepping. And I'm just going to leave that as a little Easter egg. Cause it I is. know I've heard that you have. It's a great, it's a great move. One of my favorites, but we'll leave that where it is. I'm going to leave that as a fun little treasure hunt. <laughs> I'll we'll have, figure it Amanda out. We'll talk this. about it in her little segment. She'll say, I know the answer to the question, but that's it. It's Speaking of Amanda, we should probably bring her in now. We're, we're 50 minutes into this. 50? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we're going to have to edit her back in, in the middle somewhere. No, it was so serious. Oh my gosh. Well, we can keep going. We can go past an hour for this episode because I haven't had one in quite a while. Yeah. I, I mean, oh, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So can we'll, we pause it? Anyway? Yeah. Hold it right there. Watchman. Get a cup of tea. It's time for Everything Under the Sun when we take three minutes to hear from the watchman's wife, Amanda Lawrence. This week, let's talk about you. The real you, not the version of you that our culture, other people, or your experiences inform. I have a difficult time with this, with believing that I am who God says that I am. During prayer last week, he reminded me that a big reason of how I know who God is is because of what he tells me in his word. I trust the Bible, and because I do, I can trust that he's good despite slavery still existing, and that he knows best despite cancer, and that he's faithful despite challenging circumstances. I need to rely on his view of me, despite my ideas of who I am, despite the sins of my past, and despite the current things that I'm struggling with. By telling myself who I am, I'm trying to play God. Remember that episode about the genetically? Anyway. And I don't get to do that. I don't get to play God. I don't get to define myself. So I wrote down verses that tell me how God sees me and how he sees us. And feel free to use these as affirmations or jot them down where you'll see them. I'm just going to read verses. If you would like the verse reference, um, you can reach me at the watchman's wife at gmail.com. But just let these words wash over you. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. 
For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. For those who find me, wisdom, find life and receive favor from Yahweh. He has saved us and called us to a holy life because of His own purpose and grace. And we all are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? They triumphed over the accuser by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So those who rely on faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. For we know, brothers and sisters loved by God, that He has chosen you. Well, you guys are going to be disappointed in me today because I'm not drinking tea. I'm sorry. I actually am drinking milk, but I'm drinking milk from a mug. Does that count? I I did drink tea. He did drink tea. I gave you some gratitude tea. Mm -hmm. You chose gratitude tea. I did choose which has all kinds of good stuff in it from licorice to Tulsi. And as also a listener to the Watchman Alexander podcast, it was beyond an honor to get to dive into his secret tea stash and enjoy some tea. I mean, I that's like being invited to Buckingham Palace and dining on the Royal China. That's what it felt like. <laughs> he's, he's totally looking at me like I'm full of it. <laughs> sometimes, you are. sometimes when you're connecting with people, you flatter them a little, but not too much or they see right through it. <laughs> You have to tweak your approach there yeah. just a little bit, but yeah. it was good. I appreciate the effort. <laughs> the effort. <laughs> I didn't, unfortunately, have one of my Watchman Alexander mugs for you to drink from. That was my failing. Yeah. It, well, wait. Oh, interesting. So I'm drinking out of the Hollywood Tower Hotel. So maybe he was being a little cheeky by giving me a Hollywood mug since, you know, I'm from Los Angeles, dude. I didn't plan that. That was Providence that you got. Uh, <laughs> so before we get back to talking about stuff and things, I wanted to, uh, yeah, there's a reference for you. Who knows what I'm referencing there? Write me and I'll give you a little prize if you know what I'm talking about. So uh, we just started a new year. It was the new moon of the first month of God's calendar here recently. To the best of my understanding of the calendar, there's a lot of different interpretations of God's calendar out there, and I would not claim to have the corner on truth here or to really understand which one is correct. I can tell you with 99.9% certainty that the Jewish Hillel 2 calendar is incorrect. So if you're going by the traditional Jewish calendar, you're going to be a little bit off most years because the Hillel 2 calendar is a pre-calculated calendar. Right now, I go by the sighting of the sliver of the the moon. Uh, So it's like a Karaite calendar. That may not be the right one. I don't know. Everybody's got to try and figure this out for themselves. I think God's probably going to have to straighten us all out at some point uh, by doing something miraculous and, and dramatic as he has in the distant past. But right now, you know, we're doing it the best way we can. And this actually segues into what I want to talk about next, because 
there is disagreement on this topic and a number of other ones that are pretty important. I mean, the calendar is important because God has appointed times and we are uh, we're asked to observe certain things on these appointed days. And if we don't have the right calendar, if we don't know when to start the year, and when to start the months, then we're not going to know when we should be doing these things that he's assigned to us. Um, but this is certainly not the only topic that is contentious in Christendom right now. There are many, and we're about to go to a conference where people have a diversity of opinions from Torah observance to the rapture timing to uh, Arminianism versus Calvinism. Uh, there's going to be a whole variety of opinions there. And yet we're all coming together to learn some some things that sometimes will conflict, but in many cases will synchronize. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of overlap. Or augment. Or augment, yeah. So talk about, this is one of the things that you've mentioned to me more than once, and it seems to be on your heart. So talk to me about how you deal, how you navigate through uh, these sometimes treacherous waters of Christians having different opinions on some of these things that aren't foundational, but still might be of some importance. And how do you handle that? Yeah. I mean, that's, it's an important question. And I, I, it's funny, I, as I was kind of anticipating where we were going with, with that lead in, I was thinking about what had already been brought up. And I, I think there's a truth to it. Understanding my limitation, understanding I don't hold the perfect interpretation. See, a lot of us and this is a, a big, a, a hard dividing line. A lot of us believe the Bible is the word of God. Now, if you don't, that's a whole different issue. Then, then we, we have to encounter you with grace and mercy and love to bring about a salvation understanding in the living word of God. But once, once we can agree that the Bible is the word of God, this is where we seek truth. This is we, what we use as our foundation for understanding and decision making then i've come to the conclusion well we all interpret things differently you know the the hebrew roots movement is all about looking at how the church for nearly two millennia has maybe misinterpreted certain teachings of paul or things that yeshua said to his disciples um and i so like alex you mentioned earlier that I, I listen to a lot of different teachers. I listen to a lot of different scholars. I ingest and digest things from a lot of different perspectives. And what maybe that's done uniquely in me is really created this kind of humble and fearful existence. I fear falling into error and I fear the holy God and misrepresenting him. And so I, I tread very lightly on a lot of these topics. I don't like to speak with authority. And, you know, perhaps it's not the most mature thing. I, I, I couldn't say whether this is a mature wisdom thing or a fearful flesh thing. I, I kind of choose to use that ambiguous language because I don't want to presume in myself or project a presumption that I know something you don't know and you're wrong until you agree with me. I want to have that open dialogue and, and look at things and even be able to come to a place of two interpretations that don't seem to work well together, but might we might be able to use that old expression that is so tired and played out the agree to disagree. I don't like that either because that's like, let's agree to not continue searching this thing out to its completion. But I think that we're, we're a lot of us in the in-between. There are arguments and interpretations for things that seem to stand and stand well on both sides of a lot of these spectrums. And so I choose to go, okay, well, where is the power of the spirit of God, where is the fruit of the spirit in a, in a person or in a ministry or in a belief system within those different arguments. And I guess, you know, I, I take what Paul says about whatever is noble and true and good and praiseworthy. Let's think about those things. Let's, let's 
build up the things that we agree on and stand on those and continue both individually and as we're able to have dialogues to overcome the obstacles that separate us on other things. But I really, I think it's, it's the more important thing is to find a way to love in spirit and in truth, one another, whether in the body as we perceive it or possibly outside of the body, but trying to get in as we perceive it, we don't know. We don't see fully from heaven's vantage point. So I think it's, it's better to err on the side of humility and love and preferring the other person than standing on what we believe to be a truth that we know that could potentially create a wall and a barrier not only in the relationship between that other person that might have an opposing perspective, but also to the outside world that continues to see us as mm -hmm. quote unquote Christians in fighting. And then they wonder why we have 2,100 different denominations. Exactly. And so, yeah, I, I think that I think there's a, a lot of work to be done to repair that the breach within while we're also, you know, building like Nehemiah, the wall around because we are in a war zone and it's only getting worse. And as the prophetic narrative foretells, it's only going to get worse. So, you know, I just I just go back to so many times, both in the Old and New Testaments, love and humility and self-sacrifice laying yourself down are the themes and the commands and if we can master that the head knowledge can have its place in in a better symbiosis and so i i don't know if that fully fleshes out but that's kind of where my perspective is on that let's definitely make sure that we're honing in on what paul talks about in first corinthians you know i, I committed to only preaching the gospel, Christ crucified according to the scriptures, buried and risen again according to the scriptures. So we, we want to have a good understanding of the scriptures, but we also want to know that we don't have a full understanding of the scriptures. That's why there have been arguments for thousands upon thousands of years. So that personal humility is, I think, vital to navigating these treacherous waters, both in the camp and outside the camp. You know, Ravi Zacharias talks a lot about this in his teachings on how to apologize the Christian faith versus other worldviews. People respond more to love than to an academic prowess. That's right. And so if, if, there's, if there's no love in your heart, if it's really just a conquering mentality, that, that really, in, in my opinion, comes from fear. There's an element of fear that you might not be right. So you have to con convert everyone around you to agreeing or else you'll continue to feel that nagging sense of I might not be right. Because some of these questions we can't fully understand with the veil of this life, this temporal life, like Paul says, you know, seeing dimly, then we will know fully. But I would rather err on the side of loving and laying myself down for the people around me both dramatically and in the daily small building blocks and and preferring the other person and supporting them even if i totally think they're wrong showing them love and compassion and waiting for my dad always liked to say you know teachable moments so don't presume that that was that urgency we talked about earlier you know don't presume that I have to convince this person right now. Let me just be in relationship with this person, have conversations that might be innocuous or, you know, not as loaded. And then there might be a moment where my character has been shown to be trustworthy and consistent. And maybe I've revealed that there is some wisdom in me. And then that person can reach out and say, I want more. I want your perspective on this. And I think if, if we did that more, I think that's how the kingdom really works. I think the actual body of Christ, Messiah, are the people that are walking as he walked. And he was 
very patient and very compassionate with people that were honest about their situation. He was not very patient <laughs> with people <laughs> that, hypocrites. that, yeah, that used it to hold a position of superiority or to even control and manipulate other people. I have no patience for that. And I believe that's his spirit in me that has no patience for that. So as soon as I perceive that someone is taking their truth and using it like a hammer and, and I point three fingers back at me because I have, I've learned this perspective from being the villain a lot in my story. I have a problem with using truth as a hammer. I know I have that tendency and I have to fight against that a lot. And I latched onto that insight of the fact that we have to demonstrate ourselves as being someone worth listening to before people are going to listen to us. And sometimes people will listen when we have a good argument, but most of the time they won't because people operate mostly emotionally, not logically. You know, even if a person is logical, you don't you never really divorce that from the emotional part of yourself. Mm -hmm. So we want to connect with somebody on an emotional level. We want to see something about their character. And then we're willing to open up and hear what they have to say more. And one of the things that I, this constantly gets under my skin is how people, specifically Christians, will interact on social media or just online, you know, on forums, social media, et cetera. Guys, the Internet is not a place where you're going to convince people of, all, of much of, at all. God did <laughs> really? not create the Internet. I promise you. Yeah. I promise no, he you. didn't. <laughs> um, you really can't show people love over the Internet very easily. Now we can teach each other. We can trade information. It's great for that. But in terms of making relationships happen or even just showing people authentic compassion, it's not going to happen very much at all in that in that setting. Um, but I see it and, and day it after does, day. It takes a long time. It I does. Mean, take I've a heard while. testimonies of it took four years for someone to, you know, convert someone else via Internet, daily Internet. So it does happen. But it, yeah, it doesn't happen instantly. Right. And yet I see it day after day. People jumping into the middle of a conversation with some insight which may or may not be right. And just thinking that it's going to be received because you're putting it out there. I do it too. Yeah. And, you know, in certain circumstances, if people know who you are, you might accomplish something, but most of the time you're not, especially when it comes to talking to unbelievers, but even uh, amongst believers who have differing opinions, your chance of success is pretty low. So your time is better spent elsewhere. You know, it's better spent making relationships happen in other venues and then using those channels that open up to communicate what you need to communicate. Yeah. If I could prioritize life for you and, and I'll, I'll try to come up with a perfect three points and maybe even have them all start with the same letter. I'm teasing. That'd be great. That's tongue in cheek. Let's, let's see how this goes. <laughs> it's not going to happen. First, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I don't believe you accomplish that. I think that's a part of your life. You continually have to humble thyself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Mm -hmm. So better be, you better be looking at you first. Then that started with an F. Okay. Your next one needs well, to no, start with an it F. It was the U, wouldn't it? Cause you said I'm, first, first, but anyway, first, second, <laughs> first, first. Looking at, look at you. So that could, it's either an L, a Y, or an F. So we'll see what the second one is and then we'll know what our letter is. And then we'll translate We've it. We've already failed because we don't even know don't, which letter to start off. No, but we will not see. Sometimes you have to make the journey to know what the journey was about. Right. I don't throw in little philosophical nuggets all day long. So you, we got to look at ourselves first. Then it's our families. We better be serving our families. Husbands, you better be laying down your lives for your wives. Wives, you better be submitting to your husbands. I leave that to you to sort all that out. But it's the people that we are invested in daily that we better be showing the power of the almighty kingdom of God. Then, then the community gets bigger. 
then it's, you know, whether it's our church body or our, our work relationships or whatever we do, be it word or deed, we're doing as unto the Lord. Really play that imagination game. Then, then you know, once we have that stuff settled, whether we're in a ministry or our ministry is just living out our lives, then we can interact with the bigger world. Like, I, I think the internet has deceived us into a false sense of community and a false sense of communication that that isn't powerful and it isn't effective. You know, I I always hated the I think it's a it's a sales thing or it might just be a philosophy thing, but people don't always remember what they said, what you said to them, but they always remember how you made them feel. And that's like you yeah. were saying, Alex, about. You know, the head, the head stuff is important, but the heart, it has to filter and be founded upon that. And that heart, that's where the spirit of Yeshua lives, right? That's that temple space that you in your fear and trembling have made holy because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks and the body acts. So that's your first work. And then as you're interacting with people throughout the day or the course of that relationship or interaction, you need to make sure that you're the servant. You're the one that's representing the kingdom. You're the ambassador. And that's going to involve that vulnerability we spoke about, but there's power in that because if it's, if we're not doing it that way, then we really are letting our flesh and the enemy run the show and stuff's just going to continue to fall apart around us because like the Lord said to Cain, sin is crouched at the door. It wants to dominate us. Like Paul said, I I, I don't want to do what I do. I want to do what I don't do. Like these truths are universal human truths. And so we have to be mindful of them. We have to be willing to let the light of the, the spirit and the word shine to our inner being and reveal that in us. And hopefully that translates to how we perceive other people and it will make us more. It, it, it has to, if, if it's the work of God almighty, it has to make us more compassionate and, and merciful and tender and kind. If we're not becoming more like that, it's not the work of the spirit of the God that sent Yeshua to die for you. It's not. I will make that emphatic statement. Mm -hmm. So love above all things. Amen. And then we put people first before particulars of doctrine. Yeah. So having established that, now I just want to add on that there are times when you do have to stand for truth. And this is one of those fine lines that we walk in life is determining, you know, when do we stand up and when do we err on the side of just yeah. being kind to people and letting it go. And I personally, I let the Bible try to do that for me. I let it try to tell me what are the doctrines that are absolutely fundamental and if we don't agree on those things, then I really shouldn't be trying to have fellowship. It doesn't mean I stop loving people. It just means I'm not going to have fellowship with them. But there's not very many of those. And so I think people need to approach that topic very carefully and not go to just every little thing in the Bible that talks about this is truth. You know, this is because there's lots of truths there. Um, there's lots of doctrines to be found. But the Apostle John and the book of Hebrews and a couple other places have really narrowed it down for us and told us these are the things that are absolutely crucial if you're going to call yourself a little Christian, you know, or a little Christ. So there are, I think, six doctrines that are listed as the fundamentals of the faith in the book of Hebrews. And some of those things we would all, you know, immediately say, yeah, absolutely. Of course, no, no, you Yeshua want to, you want was resurrected. Do you want to do the test with me? See if we, if we have fellowship? I don't okay. know what six you're talking the about. The elementary principles test. Yeah, let's make sure. Let's make sure this this interview is over and I will be kicked out of this house. <laughs> I bet you'll pass them. Well, hold on. Let me go. <laughs> let me go grab a Bible and I'll be right back. Okay, this comes from Hebrews chapter five, verse 13 through chapter six, verse three. He talks about milk and solid food, how we should be progressing in our understanding from the milk to, you know, meteor matters. 
but he says this is the milk. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So the milk here is those things, uh, repentance from dead works, faith toward God, instruction about washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So I look at this list, and I take it very seriously, and I say, you have to believe God is who he says he is. That's the faith toward God part. Repentance from dead works, to me, is turning away from sin, turning towards the way of life that God has for us and bearing good fruit. And then instruction about washings and laying on hands is where it gets a little dicey for a lot of folks. What exactly is he referencing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then the resurrection of the dead. So not just Yeshua, but that all people are resurrected, which is uh, one of those things the Pharisees got right and the Sadducees didn't. Correct. And finally, eternal judgment. So judgment that is uh, once and for all. It's not something where we get another shot at things. But well, we know that I did already say in my, you know, testimony about Lyft that I do tell young children, well, teenagers, that they will stand before a holy God. So that covers five and six. So we definitely know I, we agree on that. <sighs> Amen. And I definitely believe that God is who he says he is for no man who prays to God and doesn't believe that he is who he says he is or that he's the generous giver of those who ask for the spirit will in any way receive. So that one's good. And actually, one thing that's not explicitly stated here is belief in Yeshua, but it's implied because the book of Hebrews is all about Yeshua being sure. the one that, that God has sent. Right. The Messiah and where, greater where than we, Moses, greater uh, than the angels. Actually, where we might argue is, is this the perfect list or are there other lists? So that that might be where different people will fall mm. in different systematic theological contentions like, OK, so this is excluding all other possible lists. This is the list or. You know, is it possible? Well, they wouldn't contradict each other, though, would there? Even right. if there are different lists, which right. there are. But but you're, you know, to to use this list as this is the the milk, this is the bare minimum requirement before we even get to the potential of maturity. I don't know. See, I wasn't prepared for this to, to debate <laughs> this scholarly, and I have no intention of debating it scholarly. I'm just kind of reacting the way that I do philosophically. Yeah, fair enough. Um, the Apostle John puts a lot of emphasis on how we think about the Messiah, how, how we think about Yeshua. Sure. And that being we know Paul the foundation clearly, of salvation. You know, brings that up multiple times. Paul does, yeah. Right. But then I, I wanted to point, you know, to, to sidestep, and we can come back to this if we need to. I wanted to point out when we were talking about, you know, the importance of the immediate community, that's how Paul apostle that's how he discipled he built up the community he invested in that local community and then when he moved on to to establish another one he stayed in touch with it so it was a very organic interpersonal thing it wasn't paul wasn't writing the bible I mean, we've talked about that like most of these people probably had no idea or revelation that this was going to become the bible mm -hmm. you know so it was about how he interacted with people and taught them how to interact with each other and right. rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Right. These letters were about discipleship. Yeah. And, and investment in, in people. And, you know, there's a lot of communication about correction and, and how to, if you have to ultimately break fellowship, you know, you don't have to make a big to do about it. You just, there are billions of people in the world and okay, we're not, we're not aligned here, so let's break fellowship with peace, mm -hmm. I think is is what I would say I believe is the teaching of the word. Like, you don't, have, you don't have to go to war. You don't have to see them fail in order to feel like you're still right. There's a, a disagreement that you can't overcome and maintain fellowship for whatever reason, from whichever party. Then there are other people that need your time. Your time is short. Be sober minded about it. Break fellowship with peace. The tricky thing is that there's evidence and example of, 
you know, standing against false doctrines and false teachers. And this is where we all get our sword out and start polishing. And I, I don't have a definitive statement about it. I just would urge everyone to make sure that they prioritize that appropriately and, and make sure that it is the spirit of God, the living spirit of God that is telling you to expose because there's a lot of expose ministries on the YouTubes yeah, and on right. the Facebooks that I do not believe are operating with the spirit of almighty God. So, you know, if you can live at peace and you don't have to be in immediate fellowship with someone to which you disagree enough that it's not fruitful, I, I believe that there are practical principles in the word, both old and new covenants that support that and be very careful about how you brandish your sword of truth because you it's it is powerful. We are fragile beings, both of mind and body, and it hurts. And so you better be doing that scalpel hurt and not that broadsword hurt. Wise words. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And you, we have to make sure that it, it really is one of these issues that's serious which oftentimes is not the case. I've seen people break fellowship over absolutely ridiculous stuff. You know, not that long ago, somebody left because the word Christmas came up in a song that was not, the song wasn't even about Christmas, okay? It just happened to be in this song in a sort of incidental way. And this person, and I, I don't celebrate Christmas. I see the problems with Christmas, okay? But this person was so offended by that that they refused to come back to the congregation instead of saying, Hey, I was uncomfortable with the fact that that word was in that song. And can we maybe be a little more careful with our song choice or change the words or something so that we, we don't have things like that. And then you can have a fruitful discussion yeah. about the problem and a possible solution to it. You know, and even if the leadership says, no, it's not a big deal to us. We're not going to do that. I think what the word instructs us to do is place others before ourselves, to prefer other people before ourselves. And even to, as you were saying off the mic a couple of minutes ago, fall on the sword. It's better for us to take one for the team yeah. than to demand our way every time if it's not something that's totally critical. Yeah. And like, because for me, so I, and I've shared this with Alex, like I approach the world and even looking at the Bible. So I'm aware of this. This is, this is a me thing. I I'm a philosopher. So I approach things philosophically when I'm looking at them. That's why I listen to a lot of perspectives and I've come to the understanding that fear and love are diametrically opposed, uh, opposed points on a spectrum. And so I always ask the question, what's motivating this? You know, because John in his epistles talks a lot about if you don't have love, then you don't know the father. Father is love. Like there's just so much language about love. And clearly we're all standing against the misappropriation of the term love in our modern culture. Absolutely. So we're, we're not confused about that. But there's still an emotion about love. There's still, you know, a, a tenderness about love. Those things are true. And it, to me, it's always been doing what's best for them, for, for right, other people. Right. And so sometimes is usually that requires correction, doing things reproof, gently. right? That does require those things. But yeah, it, it has to be done gently and humbly. We have to know. And you better fix that thing in you first, right? Like, right. like take the punk out of your own. I'll, I'll, I'll admit to a reoccurring element in my life. I like to call it the, uh, the is it the Gershonites or the Gibeonites? I can never remember when Israel makes the covenant with that tribe in Canaan and then they have to live with them. So the, the, mm -hmm. we call this a portion of my life that is not yet fully overcome. So I'm a smoker. I smoke cigarettes. But I don't presume to tell other smokers to quit smoking because that would be ludicrous. I nor do I presume that the fact that I smoke is no big deal. Right. So 
I'm mindful of this point of contention in myself. And so I adjust my interaction with people accordingly. I try to be respectful. Like I don't blow smoke in people's faces, but it's still, it's an addiction that I'm wrestling with. And it, it hasn't been just a snap. It's, it's over. And maybe I haven't laid it at, upon the altar enough. That's where I'm at. I'm willing to admit my own limitation there, but I don't presume to make that something that I have any authority to speak purity over someone else's life. You know, so if someone else is doing something that's clearly harmful to their body, I have to be really careful because I can, it's like, you know, the Lord tells us to remove the footholds of the enemy, or there's talk a lot about closing doors to the enemy because yeah, you can't be casting out the spirit of Beelzebub when Beelzebub is still holds authority over parts of your life. So, I mean, that's, that's a tough reality that I think a lot of people don't choose to face. And then that's where hypocrisy takes seat is when they, they want to fix that thing in the other person, even from a a noble intention, like that thing looks dangerous to you, but they, they're not even aware of the things in them. The, yeah. the planks in their own eye. And that's that's what that parable idiom imagery is about. That's why we said that was that's point number one. That's first. Better get yourself. And it's not, it doesn't happen once. It's continuous. It's that constant relationship of being made sanctified and purified and holy. Learning more about what are the commandments of Jesus right? Are they just this euphemistic loving God and loving Christ as the modern church might argue if in conversation with a Hebrew roots person that says, no, they're all of the commandments that we have been given by the same singular God, Yahweh, Yeshua. So you better sort that out and then walk in non-hypocrisy and also be aware of places where our hearts are hard. And, and really contend with that. That's the only way he's going to impact other people through us. His work will be done. But if we want to be a participant in that, we have to be vessels of honor. And it, you can't just do it casually. It's not just once a week, whether it's Saturday or Sunday, it doesn't matter. It's every moment of every day of your life. It's every thought. And it's losing your life. You know, that's a, that's a big thing. With me, because we've become so postmodern in our understanding and our interpretation as as a culture, you know, this life. Even if we abstractly believe in an afterlife or the kingdom or the spiritual world, when push comes to shove, we're really more concerned about the day to day, the bills, the the vacations, the stresses. The more that we give the Lord authority over everything in our life, the more that he's there in it and can become king. You know, I, I just, it's, it's a constant process. It's not a magic thing that happened once. It's always, it all comes back to humility. Humility is my big word right now in this season of my life. It's my word over me. It's my word in conversation because it's, it's so important. Well, I think we've probably talked people to death. Yeah, I'm bored. So we better wrap this up. <laughs> so that's never good. Yeah, we better stop it now. I'm never bored talking about the Lord. I just, I was telling Alex, it it's hard for me to do this in front of a microphone because I, I want to do this with a person. So I, I believe that there's something that has to have come out in this conversation that somebody needed to hear. I know the Lord uses the devil's internet. <laughs> and and i bless you i bless you that are listening that have st- stuck around if you're still listening you receive this blessing i really with all of my heart i i'm grateful for you because the fact that you listen to watchman alexander means you want to learn truth he is a man of integrity and he he runs this ministry with integrity i've always respected that i'm proud and honored to call him a good friend and so I, I bless you in, in the listening, in the studying, in the learning, and may you just know the presence of God Almighty, El Shaddai, the one who formed out of the substance of his perfection, all things. 
May he bless you today with his shalom. Thank you, Taylor. Well, you heard it, folks. You should listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> what an endorsement. <laughs> I guess the humility thing didn't really set in, did it? <laughs> He's going to have to listen to this one a couple times. <laughs> yeah, we're just walking through all this stuff together. I'm learning. Hopefully you're learning with me. And uh, we're growing in faith together, uh, becoming more like Yeshua. That's what this is all about. And I think we heard some good advice today on how to go along with that process. Remember to send in your questions. I have one that I'm going to do next time, but... Uh, I don't really have a backlog of questions. So if you have things that are on your mind, please remember to send them to me at questions at watchmanalexander.com. And I will make sure to answer those on air. That wraps up this episode. Until next time, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Watchman out. <laughs>